Because I've always taken over school districts that have been in severe financial distress, in fact, governmental units in financial distress, I was the city budget director before I became the school superintendent, uh, I've always had to do more with less, so to speak. So over time, over three decades, you kind of learn how to be creative. Uh, because by nature, I'm not a guy who likes to cut and dismantle. I'm, I'm a person who likes to invest. So uh, by uh, being able to really work with some extraordinary people, many of whom have gone on to become superintendents, I think there's over 30 superintendents who at one time or another worked for me. Not all of them claim me, I might add, and I don't claim all of them including one education secretary, by the way, uh, but also CFOs, COOs, et cetera, who have gone on to do far better things and have far better pensions than I do. You don't get pensions for going to Haiti and New Orleans or going to Chile after the earthquakes uh, there. But, but the, um, my approach has always been to look at budgets uh, in a very organic way and to see them as school improvement vehicles, to do my long-term projections on available revenues and to build the budgets accordingly. So the comprehensive presentation, which you're going to be able to access online, really meticulously goes through how that can be done. And my approach is always to identify what the critical components of high-performing schools are and then to build a budget and organize the, uh, the, the district around that. And because I've always been able to do that successfully, I've always been able to uh, quickly stabilize the district's finances. And in all of my districts, academic performance has improved. In Philly, for example, we tripled math scores and double reading scores. And in New Orleans, for seven consecutive years, the recovery school district led the state in growth. And the closest district, second, was 22 points behind in terms of the growth during that period. So we clearly have had success. But the idea here is to think long term, because if you think long term, you can be more creative. But if you think long term, the dollar you save in year one is $5 over the term of the contract. If you think long term, the finding $1 in efficiencies the first year is $5 if it's permanent efficiencies over five years. So when you think long term and when everything you do is with an eye towards how the district's going to look five years from now, you'll be amazed at how creative you can be and how effective you can be. So that's an approach that I've always taken. In fact, in Chicago, I inherited a structural deficit of about a billion dollars. It was a projected deficit. And they always exaggerate their deficit, so it probably was a lot less than that. But six years later, 78 new school buildings later, 350 renovated schools later, we, uh, we left a district with a billion dollars in cash balances and 13 bond rating upgrades. And a district that had 40,000 more students than when, we, than when we took over. So there's absolutely no substitute for long-term planning. So uh, this document is an overall document, but I've assembled two, two, two toolboxes. Uh, one toolbox on how to basically assemble a budget, how to do discovery, and how to meticulously go through the provisions um, you know, the step-by-step -step approach towards laying out long-term financial planning, what you need to watch out for, some of the creative things you could do. But I've also included a second toolbox, and that's a school improvement toolbox that I think your educators might find beneficial. In other words, a toolbox that they can use to evaluate and assess individual schools. Because uh, over the years, I've studied there, I've determined that there's five essential components of high-performing schools. And whether they're charters or private schools or magnet schools or traditional public schools, there are certain commonalities that exist in those schools, certain consistent commonalities. And those commonalities are the following. First of all, they all have embraced a comprehensive curriculum instructional plan that is consistent grade by grade. There's consistency and continuity. And the staffing models and the use of time and the, uh, and, and the, uh, the use of formative assessments are all designed to support that model. And so that at, at every grade level, there's a continuity of instruction. The second thing is the use of data. Schools effectively use data. And this is all in, in the PowerPoint presentation, the effective use of data, data-driven instruction. Third is interventions. In other words, allocating the time in the day and through extended day and through extended year in summer school to provide the intervention services that are needed that the data dictates. The fourth is organizing schools, organize, recruiting and, and uh, training and retaining teachers, having a human resource plan in each of the schools and having each of the schools led by an instructional leadership team so you're not dependent on high performing, uh, on a single principal for the success or failure of a school. And then the fifth component is the use of time, instructional time on tasks. 
maximizing instructional time on task. You know, I could brag and say my education initiatives were the reason why New Orleans had dramatic improvements in student performance, but really what changed the game in New Orleans was the fact that the instructional time for the children on the average was about 33% more than what was required by the state. So maybe it wasn't the curriculum instructional models at all. But uh, what I found is that all high-performing schools have those components. We looked at what we called the 90-90-90 schools, schools that were 90% uh, at uh, um, below the poverty level, 90% minority, and 90% of the children were at, were at uh, uh, um, proficiency or above. And all those schools had those commonalities. So you build a budget around those commonalities. You design a budget that, in effect, supports uh, that those, what I call, five essential practices. You build a budget around it. You make a long-term commitment to that so that whatever happens in the district, those five things, to standardize a high quality curriculum, the effective use of data, the interventions, the uh, leadership team and the constant ongoing training, and the maximization of instructional time on time uh, on task is protected. And believe it or not, it does not require a large allocation of budget resources in order to do that. In Bridgeport, Connecticut, I found that by by uh, segregating 3% of my overall budget, I could maintain uh, the uh, materials needed in the classroom to, in effect, uh, ensure that all the teachers had the resources they needed to provide a, a strong continuity of high quality instruction, and that I could also lease but not buy technology so that every single classroom could be state of the art. And by leasing the technology, every three years, as you know, technology companies write off their leases, or they write off their technology. They basically write it off as a loss. So every three years, I would have all the technology uh, replaced by new technology, and the, generally the utility companies, or the uh, uh, technology companies would give me their old technology. So the, the classrooms became organic. In other words, every single classroom always had state-of-the-art materials. Every single classroom always had state-of-the-art technology that was constantly being upgraded. In fact, I rode the tail of the companies uh, whose livelihood depends on them uh, being able to provide high quality curriculum instructional models and state-of-the-art technology for an allocation, actually it was 1.67% of my budget. Just imagine if you could set aside 5% of your budget over time so that every single classroom became a watertight compartment, so to speak. It didn't matter if you, uh, if you hit financial headwinds that destabilized the district as a whole, the whole idea was to preserve the sanctity of that classroom and to make sure it was positively resourced. But I didn't learn that the first year. It took me probably about a decade to learn that. So, uh, so the toolboxes uh, lay out all those models, uh, all those models, all those templates, and take them back to their districts. They're free, you can access them. Since I've stolen them from the best people, I would feel, uh, I would feel really guilty about actually putting the materials out and then asking for compensation. So that's, that's how I do my penance. So, uh, uh, you know, so uh, I hope you find the materials helpful. What I wanted to do, though, is, is I wanted to zero in on some facility issues, because I've done $7 billion in school construction in now uh, four cities. As mentioned, Chicago, $3.2 billion, $1.7 billion in Philadelphia. Of course, believe me, New Orleans wasn't a hard lift. The hard lift was negotiating a comprehensive settlement with FEMA so that FEMA treated us uh, uh, not as an insurance company, because what FEMA does is FEMA treats you as a, like an insurance like an insurance company. 6,000 erasers were destroyed. They pay us the money to replace the erasers. We have to replace the erasers. So our approach in, in New Orleans was to basically say, look, we're gonna develop a, a comprehensive facility plan for the district that recognizes that the district has half the number of kids that it used to have 10 years ago. We don't need 120 schools, we need 86 schools, but we want settlements on our 120 schools. And it took us about three years, but we actually negotiated that type of a settlement. We submitted our plan. They budgeted it for $1.9 billion. There's not a kid in a substandard school that's either new or hasn't been completely renovated. So that's the approach we took. We actually turned FEMA or transformed FEMA with a little help from the uh, uh, Senator Mary Landrieu, the former 
senator from, uh, from Louisiana, we were able to transform FEMA into kind of like a, a redevelopment authority as opposed to uh, an insurance company. So that can have a transformation effect. So, so the bot but the bottom line is I've done a lot of school construction over time. Uh, even in Bridgeport, a uh, uh, district that was on the verge of bankruptcy, we, we had a capital plan. It's the smallest district I ran. It had 22,000 students. And believe me, the smaller the district, the tougher the district. I, I was in Chicago, I used to say that the, the superintendent that has the toughest job in the state of Illinois is the superintendent of Nutura High School. Because in Nutura High School, that's one high school, every parent thought their child should be the valedictorian or salutatorian. And he never, he never had a good day. Where me, now these expectations were different. So I always had that type of cover where if I even showed the pulse, people were praising me and, and singing my praises. But the bottom line is, is um, you learn over time a way to address your facility issues and to, so that you can uh, uh, develop a strategy even in the most trying financial cir circumstances to improve the condition of your facilities. So what I did was I pulled from the, I pulled from the presentation eight points, eight points that I wanna make or eight points that I've, I've taken uh, from, a uh, from a facility standpoint. And because I've run very large districts, that it, it differs. Some of these uh, things may not be relevant to obviously districts that are smaller. But at the end of the day, these are things that have consistently uh, uh, proven to be effective uh, for me. And uh, the first was my approach ha has always been to find the talent within the school system that I've taken responsibility for and to in effect promote those individuals who have the experience and have the skills, uh, have the know-how to get it done. I've never had time to go in and to assemble a team from the outside uh, and have them spend the first month trying to figure out where they're gonna park and where they're gonna live or who they're gonna associate with. So in all the districts, even, even uh, hurricane, literally hurricane destroyed New Orleans, there was always talent that within that district that I was able to promote and give a, responsibilities to. Uh, and that allowed me to hit the ground running. And, and I've always, I've certainly discovered that on the facility side. I brought one person in to do my facilities, Big Mike Johnson, when I was in Philadelphia. Everybody else in the facilities department were there, in the capital management. Uh, everyone else on the facilities and operations side, I retained, uh, obviously dismissing some people and promoting others, but it was basically in-house. So, so don't be afraid to tap into the talent that's there. Sometimes. You know, I, I, I always say that I never use the word bureaucracy because nobody wants to be told by someone who works for them uh, uh, that, they, that, they, uh, that they're bureaucrats or that they're part of bureaucracy. So I've always viewed myself as a liberator of bureaucracies. I'm the great liberator. So at the end of the day, that has always worked. The second thing that I've always done is always, I've always looked for opportunities, and these are the personal things, to demonstrate my willingness to make personal sacrifices. So like in Chicago, I froze my pay for six years. I think my salary was $150,000, which gave me seven cents per student, where in, in, um, in Highland Park, I think the superintendent there was getting about $800 per student. But the point is by doing that, uh, uh, and by always defending my people and taking responsibility personally for things that went wrong in the department, because the book stopped with me, uh, you develop loyalty. You, people will, will, you know, aren't limited by days or hours. They'll do anything for you. Uh, and by doing that, I was able to negotiate conservative collective bargaining agreements that allowed me to address my, my long-term financial challenges and, in effect, negotiate contracts that we could ac actually afford so that we were able to build cash reserves. We actually got 12 bond rating upgrades. In the sh we went from no investment grade to AAA for all three rating agencies in the Chicago, Chicago Public Schools. So demonstrating, looking for every opportunity to demonstrate leadership by leading by example, by taking responsibility number one, and by demonstrating the willingness to make personal sacrifices makes a difference. Now you don't have to go overboard, because trust me, if you look at my pension, you'll see I've gone overboard, unfortunately, as my wife reminds me, which is why she's still working at TSA. But at the end of the day, it sure makes you feel good, and you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. Third is there's no substitution for long-term planning. You have got to do long-term planning, whether it's facilities, whether it's academics. You assess your resources over an extended period of time, and you, in effect, set your priorities accordingly. It cannot be a year-to-year -year plan. 
And these five-year financial plans have to be realistic and practical plans. And you've got to make sure that when you're doing your five-year plan, you're placing an emphasis on things like uh, uh, deferred maintenance. Uh, they, you, you're, you're making the type of capital investments that will be the type of investments that save you money in the long term. So I would always spend more time, sp spend the money to renovate 20 schools as opposed to building a brand new school. So the priorities were always in the main maintenance, uh, the, the maintaining and support uh, of our existing buildings. In Philadelphia, where we had s significant financial challenges, I found a way to build a $1.7 billion school construction plan by issuing bonds and, and amortizing the interest so that when the existing debt service uh, was, uh, uh, began to decline, uh, the, uh, the tax rate would remain the same and, and the new revenues would be used to finance the $1.7 billion school construction plan. So I was able to do that without raising property taxes. Uh, but, uh, but our approach was, uh, we had a program called the Wolf Pack. And we had to later change it because the Wolf Pack had too many Nazi uh, connotations in Philadelphia, as we called it, Minutemen. Biblical sense, uh, the biblical term, Minutemen. So, so, but basically we had teams and they would go from school to school and do complete makeovers. So every year, about 10%, 15% of schools underwent a complete makeover. The whole idea was to have a four to five year cycle, whether it was lighting, fixtures, panels, you name it. It would be just a massive makeover. So what we were able to do was we were able to go in and to upgrade every building so that there was a con consistency and a continuity. And we got the entire community involved in the process. So when you had that makeover week or those makeover weeks, you would have the community involved, whether it was doing uh, community murals, murals, because Philadelphia is famous for its murals and uh, mural projects, or whether it was a, a, a park, et cetera, and the, the entire community got involved in the process. Uh, so so th those are the type of things that you can do uh, if you have a long-term planning uh, strategy. Uh, the fourth thing was creative financing. I've mentioned some of the creative financing things I've done. <clears throat> by partnering with other local governments, by partnering with community-based organizations, it allowed us to tap into perhaps non-traditional uh, uh, spending. Like, uh, you know, we were able to take advantage of uh, new market tax credits, for example, because we were partnering with health, because we were putting health care clinics in our schools. We used historic tax credits. Of course, in Philadelphia, it seemed that 90% of the schools were historic, which means I couldn't really tear any of them down or do sometimes major renovations. Uh, we, sometimes we use community development block grant money, uh, energy conservation money, energy conservation grants. Uh, the, the, just the savings through energy conservation can can, uh, uh, can enable you to significantly uh, uh, free up money that can then be used uh, to do uh, renovation and rehab. So we explored every possible way to go out, sale leasebacks, every possible way to go out and to raise the money needed to do capital construction, and we worked it into our, our five-year plan. Uh, the fifth thing, uh, uh, the fifth approach that I always took was the idea that speed, that you need to, to have, avoid delays in construction. You need to accelerate the construction process because delays cost you money. So for example, <clears throat> I was able to build 78 buildings <clears throat> in doing what we called MCRs. I don't know why they call them MCRs. I don't know where the acronym comes from, but it was new roofs, windows, and tuck pointing in 358 buildings. And I did it in six years. I would spend $600 million a year on school construction. Uh, and, uh, and I was able to do that by pre-designing everything. So we would bring in a managing architect to pre-design our schools. So 90% of our schools were identical. But you know, like what separates us from the gorillas? 2%, 1% of our DNA? Every school looks different, but they're really not different. The school designs, the, the materials, et cetera. So by doing that, we saved ourselves months in architectural design, number one. Number two, by having the pre-design and by standardizing the materials, I was able to bulk purchase my brick, my steel, my windows, everything. I, for six years, I controlled the market. In 2000, 1995, I was spending $126 a square foot building schools, and you can Google schools like Walter Payton or Gwendolyn Brooks or Northside College Prep if you want to see superior instruction. And in 2001, I was spending $126 a square foot. So, so we were able to control the market. We were able to literally control the market. And I pre-qualified all of my contractors because I didn't want to bid every single project and have a prolonged bidding process. 
So we pre-qualified our contractors. So we always had, we had our architects, our contractors, our subcontractors. So we, we were there. It was all about picking people. So we had the pre-qualification phase, and then for the next six years, we picked. We picked among the contractors, and we awarded them the work. So we were able to build buildings, additions, in 12 to 14 months and build new schools in 16 months. Our average change orders were 4.5%. 4.5% change orders. You won't find a, anyone in the private sector who can do that. So we were able, we were able to build at an accelerated pace and renovate 90% of the uh, schools. The sixth thing we did was to create competition. What we decided to do was create competition by doing the most, maybe the most aggressive MBE WB in the country. I adopted what I called the 50-50-50 plan. 50% 50 of all the contracts had to be war awarded to minority businesses, 50% of those hired had to be minority, and 50% had to be city residents. Well, in six years, $1.74 billion went to minority contractors, and $1.78 billion went to minority workers, and 52% of those were city residents. Now, were we lowering our standards? Absolutely not. What we actually did was we created so much competition, we were able to control our costs. And we never built buildings that were better than the buildings we built. Walter Payton, Google Walter Payton, at times it's been ranked the number one high school in the state, in the uh, country. In 2017, I think it was ranked number one US World News Report. We built that high school for $25 million. Two years after I left and they built Jones Magnet High School in Chicago, they built it for $110 million. You look at those two schools, you tell me what schools are better. So the competition, the competition not only provided an economic shot in the arm uh, in the community, in our poorest communities, because what we would do, because we were pre-qualifying, is every year we would have vendor fairs and job fairs. So we'd bring vendors together, minority majority vendors, and they would hook up partnerships, and then we would bring, uh, we would have job fairs, so individuals would be able to recruit, you know, re uh, recruit minorities. So we were able to create competition, and at the same time, distribute uh, our largesse. And what we did to, uh, to facilitate uh, qualified minority companies to get to work was we insured them. We provided the bonding. We took all the bonding and the bond insurance out from the politically connected bond houses that were shaking them down and, and charging minority contractors sometimes three to four times what they were charging the majority contractors, and we insured them ourselves. Because, you know, they, they used to say, well, they don't have the experience to get the bonding to do the work. Well, they can't get the bonding to do the work because they don't have the experience. I mean, it, come on, give me a break. So by doing that, we were able to create enormous competition, and we had state-of-the-art programs. So competition, increasing the competition, is critically important. And then seven was creative design. You know, uh, uh, for me, I'm obsessed with light. And there's a direct correlation between studies have said that the degree to which children have access to natural sun sunlight, environmental, can have an impact on their performance. So I became obsessed with schools with no shadow, schools where there was natural light. So all of our schools had natural light. So there, there were no schools that were built like dungeons. In Philadelphia, some of the schools were built like, like, uh, uh, like uh, I mean, there's more light in Hitler's bunker than there were in some of the schools that were built in Philadelphia. So I went into those buildings and I punched holes in the wall so I could bring some natural light into the buildings. But also in Philadelphia and New Orleans, we designed the buildings so that they were earthquake or hurricane proof by elevating the buildings or building flood walls and then uh, uh, building what we call, installing what we call missile resistant windows. So 120 mile an hour projectiles cannot break those windows. And of course, all the schools had their own generators, which means they could be lifeboats if the city ever flooded again. And I was, and incidentally, is this a costly expenditure? Absolutely not. I was still spending maybe $35, $40 million. I don't think I built a high school for, for more than $40 million in New Orleans. So we were able to build high quality high schools. And we also designed buildings so that they were multi-purpose facilities, so that they were facilities that the entire community could use so we could monetize those facilities. You know, I, you know, I think there, there's no company better not to pitch Facilitron than in effect going in and showing you, uh, you how you can monetize your facilities and how those facilities can be profitable. So they can be community centers, they can be used for, for conferences, they can be used for community gatherings, always monetizing because there's as much 
to generate through monetization as there is through energy conservation and energy efficiency is what we discovered. So both those sources of revenue become revenues that then can be, then use to upgrade to upgrade the buildings. And so so our approach was to 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 uh, uh, have buildings that could be monetized and have buildings that could be multi-purpose. In addition, my approach be really beginning in Philadelphia. Uh, uh, and I, I really learned in Philadelphia the importance of building buildings that have flexible interiors because it seemed, you know, the Chicago buildings were built when, uh, when people were really thinking about learning environments. All the buildings had windows. I replaced all the Lexon windows with, you know, regular windows. My mother used to call Lexon windows glaucoma windows because the longer you have them, the less you can see out of them. And so, uh, but, uh, but the buildings had a natural design. No building was more than three stories. They had a central, uh, they had the central uh, uh, open space when you walked in, all the floors, you know, it, uh, you know all the stairwells exited on these common floors, uh, uh, common hallways, where in, in Philadelphia, they were built like medieval castles with, with these little like fire to towers and things like that. And, and the buildings could, it was they're almost impossible to renovate because you know it seemed that every classroom had 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 an interior wall that you could not dismantle. So I became obsessed with designing buildings, what I call convention center buildings, where while you have really strong interiors, the interiors are all flexible. And I learned this from some of the charter school operators, so that walls weren't permanent. Interior walls, and the interior infrastructure was not permanent, so it could be reconfigured because the, the schools are evolving. I wanted my schools to be secure, physically secure from, from a public safety standpoint, environmentally clean, et cetera, technology platforms so that the interior of the buildings were temporary, but the exteriors were permanent so that you could constantly be reconfiguring the rooms and reconfiguring the classroom. And so that you had maximum flexibility so you wouldn't have to spend a small fortune renovating the interior of the buildings because you, you have to, you know, you have to uh, stabilize. You can't tear down certain walls. You have to stabilize the interiors. So the convention center approach uh, uh, allowed me to build buildings that were much less expensive, but buildings that could evolve, buildings that could be that that could be transformed. And, and with the constantly evolving classroom and the use of technology, at the end of the day, you want flexibility. I mean, there is so much learning that shouldn't be confined to a single space. There's so much learning that is being done online, et cetera. Uh, the traditional classrooms are becoming like prehistoric caves. So these creative designs, these creative designs uh, uh, it saved me money and it made the environments, uh, the learning environments more identical. And then finally, technology, and I, I, I commented on the use of technology. I can't understate the uh, importance of, of laying out a financial plan uh, that in effect, identifies what the classrooms need to be superior learning environments, and then en entering into long-term uh, uh, agreements, whether it's the purchase of curriculum and instructional models, or for that matter, the purchase of technology, that allows those contracts, that allows those classrooms to be continually resourced, to, to have the access, uh, so that regardless of what's happening uh, on the broader uh, budget spectrum, regardless of the financial challenges that the district is facing, this, the, the sanctity of that classroom is maintained, and it does not cost an arm and a leg to do that. Um, in fact, with all of our curriculum companies, I never buy curriculum, I lease curriculum, or I subscribe to curriculum, so the curriculum is constantly being upgraded. The companies have to have competitive, high-quality curriculum. If you partner with the right companies, those companies will continually upgrade the quality of their product, and it's the same way with technology, so that it becomes organic. The technology is constantly being upgraded so that every three years the classroom gets a makeover and the makeover does not increase your costs. You're, you don't have a float of bond. You don't have to go get E-rate money to do that. Uh, it literally becomes a part of the budget, a part of the budget maintenance. And I found that there are ways to, even in, even in school districts that are financially distressed, to create those type of conditions and, and, and to provide, uh, provide that type of uh, 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 stability uh, to the learning environment. So um, I hope this was helpful, kind of uh, um, rules of the road or uh, tricks to the trade, so to speak. And now I'd love to open it up to questions. As you go through my PowerPoint presentations and you access the workbooks, I make reference to a number of these things. So 
hopefully it'll be helpful. I, I talk about, for example, how technology can enhance all the five essential practices. I mean, if you have the right technology infrastructure, there's no reason why uh, you can't improve the quality of your curriculum because teachers always have access to superior curriculum instructional models. Of course, technology allows you to use data effectively. Technology allows you to, uh, to do interventions. Most of the, many of the most effective interventions are technology-based interventions like Read 180, et cetera. Technology can provide ongoing teacher training and coaching. And of course, technology can increase instructional time on task. If you just continue to have those learning interventions in kind of an online computer lab environment so that you can continue to have the, uh, the, the type of interventions that are consistent with your instructional plan and it can be done uh, it can be done through the use of technology. So technology, in effect, can, when you have the right technology plan and technology strategy, it can enhance and support those essential practices that are absolutely critical to high-performing schools. So uh, now uh, I've got about eight minutes for questions, and uh, I want to stay punctual. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, uh, I'm going to give you my Gmail uh, if ever you want to get hold of me and, uh, and uh, have a question or a concern or want advice on something. If I can provide it, I can connect you with an individual who can. I'm actually working with a consortium of retired superintendents like me to create a, a network, which after January will be up and running. And, and what we're going to do is we're creating a network so that school districts can access expertise, platforms, uh, uh, reach out to individuals who have uh, certain expertise in certain areas. So it can become a resource that people can go to to identify present best practices. It's a not-for-profit. Uh, uh, I've been frustrated over the years uh, over what consultants have been charging uh, school districts for even the most basic services, or for that matter, the inability of the, some of the poorest districts to not only access what's there, but to realize that there's a lot of uh, superior affordable things out there that they can take advantage of. I mean, the beauty of Facilitron is it doesn't cost. It doesn't cost any money. One of the best uh, school public safety in, uh, programs out there that uh, are going to join our platform is a, is a program called Bridget. And basically, it creates a 24-7. A it uses social media to create a, early, a, to, to create a vehicle for, for people from the community, for students to report incidents of bullying, intimidation. You know, whenever you've had school shootings, they're always telegraphed. I was in Bridgeport when Sandy Hook occurred. I had a teacher, a, a, a fifth grade teacher, whose daughter was a first grader who was killed in that classroom. So at the end of the day, I've been, pre I've been uh, uh, obsessed with this idea of school security. I've never had a single gun incident in any of my schools in, in, uh, in all my years as a superintendent because we always had the type of early reporting system that could alert us because kids always talk. They, they, you know, they always telegraph their punches. So there's a lot of platforms and a lot of in, uh, 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 initiatives out there, and, and insurance companies, for example, will pay, uh, will pay for Bridget because when schools are safe, safe they're safer, the uh, risk and the liabilities to insurance companies are reduced. So there are so many initiatives out there that, that school districts just need to know are platforms and programs out there that can be accessed, many of them for free, many of them subsidized, that they don't realize that are out there or that they don't think that they can, uh, they can, uh, they can access. So we're kind of, uh, me, and, me and my veteran colleagues are kind of obsessed with creating kind of like that safe harbor for schools to go to. But, but when, we, when we go live, we'll, uh, uh, I'll make sure that I, I reach out to you. And, but uh, my email is paulgvallis at gmail.com. It's my personal email, paulgvallas, V-A-L-L-A-S, at gmail.com. Gmail and, uh, and, and if you reach out to me, uh, don't hesitate to mention Facilitron, so I'll, I'll remember kind of word association at this time. All right, but let me open it up to some questions you may have, and I'm going to and I'm going to hang around during break. And if you have any other questions, and I'll just add to this before we go to questions that we'll be sending out a link on Friday with a lot of the presentations from the event, and then inclu we'll include your um, information in there as well. Great. Um, right. So, question? I got. Um, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna hand it to you. Uh, yeah. So, thank you again for coming. Of course, from My Chicago pleasure. as well. Of course, um, one of the key things I wrote down was the monetization of facilities. Right. So. Uh, it was one thing to set up either through a tool like Facilitron and everything else as well, but truly how to structure it, structure it so um, the money actually being used uh, is being used by the school. So That's a lot right. of times, of course, we have it where uh, schools work like the 
a federal government in the states. You know, they do their own thing, they control their own money and how well they do it or how not well they do it. But how to structure that so that they're actually using money properly once we build a new building and once we turn it over to be a community building. Yeah, so let me respond. You know, um, when you look at my presentation, I talk about I talk about segregating funds and protecting funds, you know, not mixing capital dollars with operation dollars, et cetera. I mean, you've got to maintain the, the sanctity of these funds. So when it comes to energy conservation, all the energy conservation money that I saved, I put into facilities. I didn't use it to balance the budget. Like in Chicago, because we standardize everything, I told ComEd, and you should go back to ComEd, and I, you should try to meet with John, with, uh, uh, with John Rowe, who's the ex, chairman of ComEd with all their controversies now. And I said, um, I, I want to freeze my utility costs, and I will pay you in, in the first quarter everything I owe you during that coming year. You don't have to wait. There's not going to be any delay. And he froze our utility costs for eight consecutive years, then gave us a $100 million energy conservation bond. So the bottom line, and I took that money, and I invested it in energy conservation so I could save even more money. So I was not only able to freeze my utility costs, by basically agreeing to pay them on day one, literally, or on month one of the year, so they weren't waiting, and they could generate interest on what we were paying because we were their largest customer, but uh, we were also able to get energy conservation grants to go with that. Also, when I would monetize my buildings, I would allow the schools, the school, the individual school, to keep the money for facility-related expenditures. I wouldn't bring all the money in. I would allow the schools to have that facility budget so that they could decide what they wanted to do and what they wanted to spend it on. Within parameters, there are always parameters, always parameters. It wasn't like you can spend it on you know, parties and things like that. There, there were specific things that they could decide that they would, wanted to spend it on. But as you know, with the local school councils in Chicago, that became money, discretionary money that they can use along with specific guidelines. So I'll be more than happy to spend a little more time back in Chicago talking to you about that. And, but you definitely need to, to go out to ComEd and see if you can negotiate a similar deal with them. And I'll be more than happy to connect you with John Rowe. Oh, you had a question, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes when you install the windows, you know, it, uh, you'll have a part of the window where natural light can come in, and then a part of the window where it's shaded. So the bottom line is sometimes that can control the amount of light that's coming in. So there's different ways of doing it. I never, you know, I never had that many complaints, but maybe I wasn't in the weeds enough. But there is no substitute. I mean, the beauty of, of, of the schools that were built in the 20s and 30s in Chicago is they all have these great windows. That's why they make for great condominiums when the schools are ultimately sold. Uh, and light does penetrate. And then we would have shades and things like that. So if we had to close the shades, we would close those shades so that when the sun rose and set, there was a cut. So there are things that you can do to, uh, there are things that you can do to uh, address those issues. There was one other thing I, I wanted to say about Windows and it's, oh, uh, also I, I learned something else. Uh, in, in the schools I designed in New Orleans, I learned this from the charter operators too, and because they were being innovative, was I wanted to do interior walls that were in fact half glass. Now, I designed the classrooms so that they could be secure. So for example, if there was a shooter, first of all, with uh, missile resistant windows, you can't break that glass. You just can't break it. So I didn't want the entire wall to be glass, but I wanted the wall to be glass at about, say, shoulder high. Uh, you'll be amazed how well behaved kids are and, and how energized or how, how inclined teachers are not to sit at their desks when somebody walking down the hall can look into that classroom and can see what's going on. And you'll be amazed. But some of these schools, some of these classrooms are like, they're like speakeasies. You know, there's a little slit, it's locked, you can't see what's going on. So the kids think that they can act with impunity and, and you know, teachers are perhaps a little, um, you know, they know they're not being observed. So I designed these interior, these uh, plexiglass walls on the interior, but the buildings, the classrooms can be secure, and the kids can duck, out, duck down and go against the wall if there's a, you know, because you're always conscious in this day and age, unfortunately, 
about the issue of public safety. There's ways of doing that, but I'd be more than happy to show you the school that we did. It was great. You, don't never, you never see a teacher sitting down, and the kids are always wondering who's, who's looking, who's looking through the window. It's, it's not distracting, it really is, because you don't hear the sound, but you just know you, you're always being observed. Other questions? I've got, uh, got one minute. we got time for one more. Two minutes, sorry about that. That light's I, blinding. I, I, oh, I feel right like here. I'm in an interrogation. Oh, uh, I'm in Guantanamo here being interrogated. How did you sell all of this to uh, the various boards, uh, and how did they buy into uh, all of your concepts? Well, Chicago didn't have a capital plan. So I remember when I first designed my capital plan, it was a $600 million plan. Fortunately, look, I, I've always had the benefit, uh, the, the benefit of the fact that I walked into takeovers where I had authority. So I was like, you know, I, I, I had complete authority. I could be magnanimous, but at the end of the day, I had authority. But the whole idea of developing a capital plan and making it a part of the budget that could upgrade the physical quality of schools became extremely popular. And in Chicago, I never earmarked more than 6% of my uh, budget, of my revenues, for capital, which the rating agencies target 6%. I think it was 5%. We didn't do any short-term borrowing for operations, any of that stuff, which is why we got the, the rating agencies. So capital sells. Capital sells. Capital, you can get the, the community really motivated around that. And, uh, and because I allowed the schools to have uh, discretionary authority over, over uh, ca capital savings like energy conservation, because I wanted them to save money, I wanted to incentivize them, and things like multi-use of their facilities, uh, you know, I didn't have the benefit of, of a facilitron. So we had to like very clumsily manage our facilities or depend on our, our principals to manage our facilities. But at the end of the day, because they had that discretionary pot of money, uh, uh, to build out certain things or to make certain physical improvements to the schools, it, they really felt empowered. And in Chicago, we have uh, locally elected school councils that you know, like to be able to have some decision-making authority at the local school level. So I, I've always been able to, nothing wins them over like capital construction, uh, particularly if the capital construction is not forcing you to make sacrifices elsewhere in the budget, okay? Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so much for sharing so much great information. Thank you. And thanks for joining us.